Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 23rd, 2015, and this is the week in charts. Well, I'm out of Mountain Dew again this week, so uh, my apologies for not getting jacked up on the Mountain Dew. But uh, usually I usually get a little jacked up on the Mountain Dew because we have a lot to cover, so I just have to um, work through it without the Mountain Dew. Anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. If you've been trading for more than a few days, you probably know you can trade lose money trading, or best way to sum it up is all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I want to talk about uh, better than a poke in the eye trade. And I want to talk a little bit about discretion, which may actually have, uh, come from that trade also. So we may have a um, multiple example here. Um, uh, Last week, or I think it was two weeks ago, I got asked a question, how do you know the methodology works? And there was a follow-up question on that we'll flesh out in just one second. And this got me thinking a lot about the psychology of the methodology and the feedback loop. And as uh, some of you may know, I've been working on a psychology course, and I probably will work on it for the next year. It just seems to keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. But um, I think it's I think it's psychology is that important. It is a matter of life and death, at least the way I see it. And that got me thinking. All of this got me thinking about boiling down methodologies. There's only like a few really ways to to approach the markets, and it's not my way or highway, as I often preach. But I think if you boil them down and wrap your head around them, do what makes the most sense to you. And obviously, I'm biased toward my methodology, but it's not my methodology or um, my way of the highway, I should say. And anything you want me to cover, start thinking about it now. Uh, hold off on stock questions till we get to the charts, but uh, you can ask about as many stock stocks as you want. Once we get to the charts, just ask about them one chart at a time. So just put a stock in, hit return, and then put another symbol in. And uh, also, for those who are new to the show, which we have a few new faces here today, uh, put it a stock symbol because I don't know stocks by name. I know them by symbol. Uh, so just give me the symbol versus the stock. I'll have to look them up. I know some of them. I probably know quite a few. Okay. Um, one of my slides is out of order. Um, let's say I'm going to give you a thousand dollars or let's say you're going to find a thousand dollars. Would you be happy with that? Well, you should be. It's free money, right? But sometimes we get these better than a poke in the eye trades, and we tend to forget that overall you made money. Now, this is straight from my trading service. This actually stopped out today. This is going to be a really good, uh, this might be a twofold example. But the entry was at 59.70. The initial profit target was at 50.40, and it hit that. And based on a one, 100K account, you trade roughly 200 shares. And the 200 shares are split 100 for trading and 100 for trending. Well, this one didn't work out, but this one did work out. So, roughly a nine, 10 point profit gives you about $1,000 on the trade. And that's what we're looking for 1% on a trade profit. And then some multiple thereof on the rest. So on a 100K account, if you're risking 2%, that equals $2,000. And we're looking for 1% on the first loaf or $1,000. And that's our swing trade. And then we're looking for some multiple thereof percent on the second loaf. And we don't know what that's going to be. In this particular case, it was zero. Well, so what? It's better than a poker day. You have to look at the whole trade. And the reason I'm saying give you money, not that the market gave you money, but give you money is that if you start looking at this and said, well, damn, it was at 50 and then it went to 60 and I let that evaporate. I should have done that. I should have known to sell here or here. You don't know. And you have to position yourself for unlimited gains. And I, I like to read old market books. There's nothing new under the sun. And I think the book is called Psychology of the Stock Market 
Uh, if somebody reminds me, I'll get the um, the links for you on those. And it's kind of a it's more like a booklet. It's just a little kind of a pamphlet written about a hundred years ago. Uh, Sheldon, I think, is the name of the author. And it, it it repeats something that I repeat. It's funny. I'm I'll, I'll I'll give a lecture or I'll be speaking with someone or answer an email, and I'll say something, and then later I'll read it where somebody wrote or said the same thing a hundred years ago. So it's like the the markets never change. The dynamics of the markets really never change. Like somebody a couple of weeks ago says, uh, we're seeing a market that we've never seen, and it's like well. Trust me, we've seen a market like this before. You just have to go back and look. And the point they were making is something that I said a while back. Remember what I said when I was giving a speech to some uh, money managers? And the one, one money manager is like, well, how can I tell my clients we gave up that much money? And it's like, well, on the big winners, if you took profits early, then you need to tell your clients that you did the wrong thing by not sticking with the position. And it was kind of interesting this morning. I wish I had the book on my desk. But it basically said the same thing. It's like, well, why, you know, why did you sell or, or, or did you, um, you know, why did you give up those profits? And the reason you gave up those profits was because there was a potential to, to be a much larger profit in the works. So sometimes you have to be really process-oriented and then when it's all done, look at what happened. So you have to be both process-oriented and, I guess, in goal-oriented, too. And in this particular case, you make a 1000 bucks, So it's better than a poke in the eye. Do you consider shorts even a little differently because there's not a limited gains, or do you always aim for 100% of the downside? Yeah, that's that's where it gets a little tricky, Jason. And Jason's, uh, uh obviously understands that things are a little bit more uh, complex in reality, one thing you could do, and this is kind of like uh, Dave Landry 201 or 301, but let's say you do short a stock and it does set up again, you could reshort some shares. So you could end up making uh, more than 100% on the downside. But yeah, it's, it's tougher. So you're right. So you could only make 100% on the downside. So that multiple is not unlimited. Like when I get, sometimes I get the speeches where this multiple is unlimited. But yeah, that, that max you could make is 100%. Um, but you could still make many times your original investment. Let's say it goes down to 10 bucks a share or, or whatever. And we've had some really big trades on the short side in the past. The short's not my favorite thing to do, but it just provides us with, with a really good example this week. But yeah, you're right. And the only way you can kind of beat that, so to speak, would be to swing trade around your position. But you can obviously do this on the upside too, okay? where you put shares on and take them off. But yes, good point. Anyway, you have to look at the trade overall, and it's like, well, you made $1,000, so what? Okay, you can't look at what you gave up. You can't mentally monetize the open profits if you're following the system, or if you're following any system for that matter, okay? Good point, Jason. I like the, I like the way you think on that. So, no, I don't really treat the shorts any differently other than if the opportunity presents itself, we may reshort along the way. Now, one thing I wanted to point out with this particular example is that it just kind of barely dicked that stop. Okay, if you kind of squint your eyes or put a little dot on like I just did, you really can't even see it. So... Sometimes, and I'm sure this morning there was some sort of news event or there was something happened, obviously. I have no idea. Something happened that caused this stock to rally up and hit the stop. But then notice that it came right back in so far. Okay. So if you get nicked on one, sometimes you can stay with it. Now, don't let it keep going and keep going and keep going. And then you lose overall on the trade. But if you've already taken some profits off the table and you're at break even here, you could give up a little bit more just to see if it's going to reverse. And if it does, you stick with the position, okay? And then your stop goes in right above that high. Now, again, I would encourage you, new stop would be like right here, okay? Let's say 60. Now, I would encourage you not to watch an intraday chart because on an intraday chart, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see it. Oh, you can see this. It's going to look like that. You're going to be like, ah! 
okay? But on a daily chart, you're going to see you're going to see this instead. It's going to do like this. You see it bounce up. And it's just going to be like a little blip up and back in. And you're like, oh, okay, well, I tagged that stop. I didn't, I didn't carry my stop overnight. I put my stops in every day after I see things open. Then I go off to save lives and build buildings and repair automatic transmissions and do other great things. So you come in, you see it rally up, hit the stop, which is this little tiny blip here. Squint your eyes. Okay, it went 30 cents above the stock stop on a $60 stock. So that's not that, that big of a deal. Again, don't throw caution to the wind. But if it does reverse right away, then stick with the positions. Now, you'll notice in my spreadsheet, if something is yellow or highlighted, I should say, like this NVRO, it means that it's an open position. And you can see in this open position, and hopefully so far, so far we have $2,500 open, plus it was $1,000 already taken off. Okay, <clears throat> well, notice that I've got zero for the UAL. And the reason is in the spreadsheet, in order to avoid any confusion, I track things mechanically. Okay, but in reality, if you get stock, stop, nicked like this, and then it comes right back in, then you stick with the position. Okay. Okay, you didn't get an email, Don. Uh, I think once you're signed up, now once you're signed up, you're signed up forever. So that link works um, forever. But, yeah, I'll, I'll take that into consideration. You should have got an email before the webinar started. Now, two weeks ago, somebody poised a question. How do you know the methodology works? And it's hard after seven or eight months, you feel the big winner will never come. Well, I'm going to address both of those, but what I want to do is I want to take a step back and look at the psychology of a methodology, of any methodology, and the psychology of, more importantly, of following the methodology. Now, I'm... I got my eyes open and I'm on everybody's list in the world. So I get a lot of stuff sent to me. Um, I have a lot of people send me stuff that, that they're developing things. And so I get to see a lot of stuff that's out there. And, you know, in theory, theory and practice are the same and practice. They're not Yogi Berra got credit for that. I didn't realize he actually said it. Does anybody know for sure? So somebody sent me a system not too long ago, and um, this was a private, private, um, or an individual, I should say, not a public system. And I'm looking at it, and it was pretty accurate. It looked pretty good to me as far as accuracy is concerned, but I, I didn't get all the stats that I needed. So I just asked for certain stats that and I kept try to get the, what I needed out of it to, to, to give him a, an honest opinion. And basically I saw that there was a huge drawdown, like one trade, I think it was like a market crash or something. And it wiped out months and months and months and months of gain. So my point was that, okay, you have this big drawdown that wipes out many, many months of gains, if not a whole year or more. And he came back with, yeah, but the year, the, the year actually ended in the, the actually year ended in the black. The year actually ended in the black. Okay. Now this was, this was just in the, um, this was just in the development mode. So no capital was put into harm's way. So if you're chipping away at it and then you get whacked really bad and you gave up, let's say one year worth of profits in one day. Would you really stick with that system and keep trading it? And then at the end of the year, be in the black. I don't know. Some people could do that. I can't do that. Okay. Um, but some people can. not And we're going to talk a little bit more about different systems. It just one second. But for me, the psychology it's going to be really tough to follow that type of system. And it goes 
a lot the trend following kind of goes against human nature because if you're if you're doing a pure trend following which we're going to talk about in a few minutes you're going to be wrong the majority of the time and as humans we want to be right and as humans we have to be right okay you can't be a surgeon and lose 70 percent of your patients but if you're longer term trend following that's about you can be right about 30 percent of the time now i'm going to talk a little bit about how to mitigate that and improve upon that but even if you're taking a hybrid appro approach as long as you're catching a few winners here or there you're still going to be wrong quite often sometimes 50 50 sometimes more than 50 50 but still be profitable but if you're a surgeon, you got to save as many patients as possible. At least the ones that are savable. Okay, let's let's assume you're you're taking out appendix or you're doing some sort of um, I hate to use the word routine, but routine operation, and you're losing seventy percent of your people when you take it out appendices. Well, appendices is that the right plural on that appendix? Okay. Um, it brings up some jokes, but it better not. So if if half of your of your your rebuild transmissions fail, then you're probably not going to be in business very long. So it goes against human nature. So we're thinking, okay, well, what if we had a ninety percent or ninety five percent correct system, this really great system that's going to be right the vast majority of the time. I'm going to make money month after month after month after month. The problem with that is you end up like the old commodity adage, eating like a bird and defecating like an, ele like an elephant. Now, I, got, I received this in an email a while back, and I sat on it for a while because I didn't want to offend anyone by talking about it the day it came out. Um, I, again, it's not by way or highway. If they're actually using this and they're, and they're happy using it, did fine, but I, I sat on this for uh, for a while so nobody would identify where it came from. But this was someone trying to sell me a system I got on their list, and it's 91% accurate. 91% accurate. That sounds fantastic. Sign me up, okay? So I looked at their actual system results, which were in like a trade station format, which I'm used to reading, or I've read many years. It's been years and years reading those type of results. And their average win was a dollar. Well, okay. But their average loss was $5.81. Now, the maximum drawdown in the system was 29%. Now, the way I see mechanical systems is your biggest drawdown is always ahead of you. I got to a heated argument with someone on that. It was like they started shouting at me, and, and I realized that the argument was done. They didn't hear a word I said. But... With the mechanical system, everything is in perfect hindsight. And your biggest draw drawdown, trust me, will always be ahead of you. But let's say that this 91% accurate thing continues. And I didn't have time to do it uh, before the, the presentation. But I think it would be like, I think it would be one-tenth times one-tenth. Say you're right nine out of ten times. And then you multiply that out uh, however many times in a row to figure out the chance of being wrong. But let's just say it's wrong three times in a row, which is unlikely, okay, if it continues to be 91% correct. But you got to be careful with statistics. But even if it was statistically valid, there's still a 10% chance of being wrong, okay? A 10% times 10% times 10%. Times 10%. I think I did that math right. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But there's still a chance of being wrong, let's say, three times in a row. So now you have an $18 loss and your average win is one dollar so it's going to take you 18 trades 18 plus trades to get back to break even but if you have a loss in between you may not ever recover so this is perfect hindsight okay and again this is where the theory and practice comes into mind okay and it's two things in theory and practice one would be like, would you have the wherewithal, if that's the right word, to continue to follow the system after it had a drawdown that looks like this? Would you, could you keep trading it? 
And number two, is there an aberration in the market that was identified with this system, which is perfect hindsight? Okay. Now, here's one that's 63% accurate, which actually isn't too bad if it's a trend, longer term trend following system. But in this particular case, they're making a dollar two percent, a dollar or two percent, but their average loss is a dollar. So they're, it's a very small, small edge, and they have a 38% drawdown. That's in perfect hindsight. Okay. And again, like I said earlier, your biggest drawdown is ahead of you. So if you're going to go straight off statistics and say the worst you'll ever do is 38%, well, that's a pretty hard drawdown. And with a win of a dollar two and an average loss of a dollar and only 63% correct in relation to this system. Now, 63% correct is not bad, believe it or not. If you're making like, if your average win, let's say is $6 and your average loss is $1, that's fine. That's actually a pretty awesome system. But this drawdown is really bad. And to come out of this drawdown, let's assume that's the worst it will ever get. And trust me, it will be bigger. Because, again, this was done in hindsight. Then it's going to take you a long, long time to recover. Now, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. And I wrote that in layman's. And that was after many, many years of, of being in this business. I guess maybe 15, 16, 17, 18 years or so. And then about a year or two later, I was speaking, I think it was in Houston. And someone came up to me after the presentation and they jinxed me. They said, ah, I'm, I'm a paper trader. I'm, I'm, I'm successful. It's like, well, how long have you been trading? And, and, you know, I think I might have did some air quotes. And he said two months. It's like, okay, well, that's like saying that, um, where are we now? July? Let's see, August, September. Okay, so I'm going to study surgery for two months. And then I'm going to go start doing some surgeries and I have no prior surgical knowledge. Will I be successful? I don't know. Probably not. My point is that I guess I have to put the caveat in there. I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader that has done ample and a sufficient amount of research, which I'm going to talk about in one second here. Uh, the thing you have to watch is that conditions do change. So if you have identified something, you have to be very careful that you have not identified an aberration. I do a weekly web show and, uh, one minus not point nine to the end is your chance of being wrong. Okay, Jason, calculate that for three times in a row and give me a percentage and let me know what that comes to just for uh, just for fun. Fun with math, right? <laughs> That's where I got some of this. Uh, there's a website called Fun with Math. Uh, anyway, I, I do this weekly web show as a, as a guest host for TimingResearch.com. I've been a guest host for quite a while. I guess I'm no longer a guest host. I've been there so long. But um, anyway, I got asked to do the shows. I have a lot of fun with them, and, it, and it's, it's really a neat little show. I don't like the, 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 the crux of the show. It's like a survey. Guess which way the market's going to head. I don't like that part of it, but I like interacting with these other professionals. And we've only had one idiot uh, on the show. I, I shouldn't say idiot because I guess you could go look at the all shows on YouTube and figure out who's who. But they only had one guy on there where I just completely did get it or disagreed, did, disagreed with, I should say. But other than that, we've had some really good people. Anyway, uh, in the survey, they talk about uh, people chime in on the question of the week. And we, it's just a random question, or, or it's not random, but we come up with a question each week and ask people, like, uh, what, do you, what, what do you think is the most important aspect of trading, or what's your favorite methodology, or it could really be anything. And so the question varies every week. And a few weeks back, we had questions on, like, um, you know, your methodology, whatever. And some guys like, I just trade spreads and I'm doing fantastic. Well, he probably is. But he's been trading them over the last year or two. And what's happened 
at least over the last year, the market has done this. And if you're trading spreads, you're going to do just fine or selling options or some other thing that requires a market to stay within a range. But if the market breaks out of that range, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Okay. Uh, I just trade in search of church, in search, in search church of what's happening now here. Uh, I've seen many things like a while back, I, I chimed in a forum, which I'll never do again, or <laughs> I resist the temptation of jumping in forums because you just, these people just like to sit around and, and bitch at each other. I guess if you're in your underwear in your mom's basement, you got nothing better to do than to just um, spit venom all day. But I was talking about some trading things and um, somebody's like, ah, that's BS. You know what you do? You just look at the dollar. If the dollar goes up, you you sell the eBay. If the dollar goes down, you buy the eBay. And, and that'll work until it don't. You have to be careful that whatever you're looking at is not an aberration in the market. 1999, you know, just buy the craziest wildest tech stock that's going straight up. I mean, there was one point where I was day trading and I would actually just do an intraday relative strength in printing money. Okay. Well, that'll work until it don't. So if you've identified something, just make sure it's not an aberration and you want to see the th whole thing. So the original question was, how do you know methodology works? Well, you learn, know that it works through a lot of empirical research you will ha need some experience. You will have to li live through a few iterations, bear markets, bull markets, choppy markets, et cetera, and anything in between. But you're also going to actually have to to trade it, which we'll get to in just one second, to, to feel the actual uh, loss. Okay, 10% chance of being wrong for N equals 1, 19% Chance of being wrong for N equals 2, 27.1% chance for being wrong, N equals 3, 72.9% chance of being correct three times in a row with 90% success. Okay, did that does that make sense? 10% chance of being wrong for N equals 1. Oh, okay, oh, okay, okay, so there's a 10% chance you could be wrong, but then, then each one could also be an independent event too. Okay, so that's where it gets a little tricky. They're not necessarily serially dependent. So I guess the way I need to look, there's two ways of looking at it. This is where it gets a little tricky. It's like flipping the coin. Each coin flip, if it's a balanced coin, is a 50-50 chance. But three coins in a row would be like, um, I forget all my combinatorics, but it's a 50 times 50 times 50, right? Uh, or 50 squared, it's 51 minus n squared or whatever. Yeah, it gets it gets complicated, but uh, there is a formula for that. But each each one is an independent event. So there's two ways of looking looking at it. So each time your 90% correct system, there's a 10% chance on each given trade it could be wrong, statistically. Okay. Okay, that is accurate for independent randomness variables. Okay. Yeah, we could we could really dig a hole here. I could see that uh, this really quick. Okay, we'll have to uh, come back to that. So the point is the point. Getting back to the the what's going on. Just make sure that what you're doing is not some sort of aberration. Okay. Um, I've gotten emails from people. And it's like they'll they'll be they'll trade S and P futures and they're risking they're risking six points to make one point. And I'm like, you got to be careful with that. Well, it's worked for the last two years. So you got to be you know call me call me a year from now and let me know how you do it. Never hear back from. Them, okay. Somebody says me this fantastic system. Okay, looks great. Trade it for a couple years and they get back to me. Trade it with real money for a couple years and they get back to me. They never get back to me. Okay. So the way you know your methodology works is you live through a few cycles. Know the whole elephant. Where am I going with the elephant? Well, right here. Okay. The old Indian proverb of blind men on the elephant. I did a Google this morning. I found a couple more. I didn't, the guy on top, I never thought about him. It's a fan, okay? Slapping. The guy on the side of the elephant says it's a wall. Uh, these guys are blind, by the way. The guy in the back thinks it's a rope. 
this guy thinks is a snake. This lady thinks it's a tree trunk, okay? And this guy thinks it's a spear. So, depending on where your perspective is, you think it's always a certain thing. Like someone came into the trading service and says, this guy just trades IPOs. Well, that's what's really working right now, and that's always been a part of the methodology. But there's a lot more things, too. IPOs in, in, in highly inefficient stocks. Well, if we get into a bear market, you'll see that we will trade some efficient stocks, just the opposite of what we're looking for. That UAL was a very thick, inefficient stock. As a general statement, I trade mostly small cap stocks. Small cap, more speculative issues, more inefficient issues, issues that are higher in volatility. I got an article coming out, by the way, in August. It should be out uh, within a week or so in Traders Magazine. As soon as it's up, I'll put it under special reports, so I'll get that to you. Uh, talking about why you should trade more volatile stocks. If you can't wait, go and watch some YouTubes for the week in charts where we talk about that. So as a general statement, yeah, I trade more volatile stocks more inefficient stocks, more smaller cap stocks. But if you look longer term and see like in a bear market, maybe we're trading efficient stocks. Okay. Maybe if the volatility over overall market comes down, we have to drop down our volatility in our stock. So it all depends on what's going on in the market. So if you're just trading one particular methodology, there's a saying in the South, the sun doesn't, shine on the same dog's ass every day and it doesn't so you're going to have some really great success over a short period of time but over a longer period of time you're going to have some ups and some downs okay the book is psychology of stock market by g c sheldon yeah it's like a booklet it's pretty little okay Okay, now here is the getting back to the the psychology and the methodology, and I thought of this a couple of weeks ago when I was working on my psychology course and thinking about the paper trader and all. And the reason I said I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader is number one, I haven't. Well, up until that, with that one caveat, that one individual, I guess. But the reason I said that is because once the trading psychology comes into play, letting that letting that open gain evaporate and getting scratched out on that second loaf on that on that UAL trade, okay, living through that is a lot harder than just looking at it on paper and saying, oh, okay, well, from there to there, and I made a thousand dollars, okay. That's a lot harder. Like the gentleman asked earlier, which we're going to come back to is like I'm waiting and waiting for that next big winner. What if it ever comes along? Well, how long could I how long should I wait, okay? So you're going to have to come up with a methodology. And that's pretty easy. There's a lot of system writers out there. I was guilty of doing that. Okay? I I I went out I actually learned fundamentals for a while. I actually when I had a day job uh, I would go to the library on weekends and nights and uh, it, it, it read value line. I know you want to party with me, huh? <laughs> and, and then I discovered technical analysis. And then because I had a degree in computer science, I got heavily into mechanical system development. But it's pretty easy to develop a mechanical system. Following it, as I just alluded to, not so much. But until you take a methodology, you're not going to know how you're going to react from a psychological standpoint until you actually start trading that methodology. You might have the greatest methodology in the world, but you may not have the psychology to actually follow it. So you're going to have to have actual feelings and emotions and everything else that comes with going through the ups and the downs of the methodology in order to find it. I was, um, what's his name? Jake Bernstein was uh, on a panel. I was on a panel with him down in Australia a couple of years back. 
probably five years ago now. And he developed the system, but he said that he couldn't actually follow it. So he pays a guy to trade the system for him. And he told him, he said, if you break the rules, you will be fired. So that's kind of an interesting thing. He found a system that works, but he knows that he can't actually trade it. Okay. So people have asked me before, Dave, is your money a position management statistical or psychological? And my answer is yes. The psychological point is that I'm trading for a small gain and that rewards my need for quick fulfillment and I'm trading for a long gain and that rewards my need to be right in a big way. The trading for a small gain statistically is I know that there is not a very good chance of a longer term trend developing statistically. Now at any given trade, I think there's a good chance, right? But if you look at it statistically, there's probably not a huge chance of that trend developing. In fact, we're going to look at that in just one second. It, it, in reality, as I often say, it's probably about 28% chance of that long-term trend developing out of a position. But that's still a pretty good chance. But statistically, I know there's a good chance it won't, so I better take some money, put it in my pocket. And if I get that stop to break even when I do so, then I have, quote, unquote, a free position. And if this thing works... I can make a lot of money. And if it doesn't, eh, so what? So that's where the that's where my money position management and my general approach to the markets comes into play. Now let's ball down a few um, different trading systems, okay? And the longer you're in this business, the more simple everything looks. OK, now we're going to throw out some wild and crazy systems that, that are that are, are archaic. You know, these things that that I don't want to pick on anyone in case you're trying those methodologies. But there are some methodologies that you're counting things and and the counts always change. And if it works, the count is correct. But if it doesn't work, no, 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 the count was wrong. And you go back and you redo the count. You realize you were wrong and you start over. Well, we're going to avoid getting into that. But for the most part, you could boil down systems into just a few small categories. Okay. So let's say you are a trend follower and you're trying to catch longer term trends. And we'll just call it generic trend following or even breakout trading. Well, like I just said, you're going to be wrong quite often you will make a lot of money when the market trends. And this is what your equity curve will probably look like. Like uh, Covell says, it's like riding a bron bouncing Bronco. Bucking Bronco is what he said, okay? Um, with, a, with a silent F, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, trying to hang on. Well, there's been some very famous traders who have done some phenomenal things with uh, just simple breakout trades. I'm not going to pick on anybody individually, but I think you know who they are, and you've probably read about them. But what they fail to tell you is most of these guys subsequently blow up. So the best way to make the most amount of money the fastest is with trend following. But when you're not catching trends and you're getting chewed up, at worse you're having sharp reversals, then you're going to have some really bad drawdowns. And that's why some of these guys, you know, you read about them on a book, in all the books and all, they subsequently blow up. And some of them blow up, come back, blow up, come back, blow up, come back. It's kind of like you might want to just put a little money aside next time you're on a good ride or just quit. So the problem is, there's the potential for a huge drawdown if you're doing some sort of generic kind of trend following, such as trading trading breakouts, trading full positions, and hanging on in a good, bad, and a different. So do read about these 
world famous trend followers and read all the books but just realize that a lot of them will subsequently blow up one of the guys and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna point him out because he was he actually said it point blank the reason he was so successful was because he had the mindset to be able to ride out the drawdowns and stick with it where everybody else would quit when they hit a drawdown and they they abandoned the system where to him it, he didn't care he had that he had that mindset so when one of the drawdowns became too great obviously he blew up but had he not had the original mindset and he makes a great point he would not have he would not have went from here to here okay had he not had the right mindset to follow that system now the so-called like income producing systems and like i talked about spreads earlier uh reversion to the mean stuff selling options reversion to the mean stuff for those who aren't uh, who are a little newer to trading uh you basically when a market is overbought you sell it and when a market is oversold you buy it on paper it sounds pretty good the problem is sometimes that market becomes more oversold and more oversold and more oversold and more oversold and you're supposed to buy it here but then it keeps going down metaphorically it's like the dog on a leash the dog walks back and forth across the sidewalk well every now and then the leash breaks okay and that does happen the so-called black swans will show up if you are a true reversion to the bead system trader just like if you are a true longer term trend follower then you have to trade through the drawdowns if you are a true reversion to the bead player you can't use stops okay if you're doing it in its purest form so your system equity curve is going to look like this and each little kind of blip I've drawn in here adds a little trade so you're gonna slowly make money bam you're gonna get it whacked then you're gonna slowly crawl back then you're gonna get whacked ritz and repeat okay until one time either psychologically or financially your drawdown is gonna to be too big to survive now I do know some reversion or one gentleman in, in, in particular uh, because of the reversion to the bead stuff does have that blow up characteristic he does use stops he doesn't make as much money as his counterparts but he's also gonna live to fight another day he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day by having stops in place with the reversion to the mean system okay so what do you do well I kind of see my hybrid approach as being a little bit of the best of both worlds. I'm combining combining reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend, in other words, pullbacks, plus short-term profit trading, taking, I'm sorry, combined with longer-term trend following. So your equity curve is going to look more like this. When the market is trending nicely, you're going to, find my pen here it is, you're going to make money. I mean, you're, the, the longer term trend follow will probably look more like that, right? And then when things begin to chop around, your equity curve may look like this, and then it may begin to drop a little bit. The beauty is it will flatten out because eventually you're going to end flat in waiting for positions. Whereas if you're longer term trend following, you're going to get chopped up and you're going to have to, you're still holding on to positions and your stops are going to be extremely wide and you're going to have a pretty serious drawdown. But if you're scaling out and trailing your stop higher, you're going to help to mitigate those drawdowns. So longer term, it's going to look like this. Now, there will be some flat times, and there will be still drawdowns. And right here, I drew in a long flat time on purpose, okay? But the drawdown itself will flatten out because eventually you'll end up flat, and you'll take a trade here or there. Nope, doesn't work out, works out a little bit. You'll end up flat again, take a few trades until all of a sudden you start catching trades again, and then that curve begins to take off. By the way, I didn't have time to put the slide in, but one of my favorite examples is when, you know, somebody started trading the service here, and they went to here, and on this particular day right here, they sent me an email, bravo for your system. And then, of course, I knew that was a kiss of death. What happened? The market did this, 
and uh, I get an email here telling me that I suck. Okay, <laughs> so well, that's just the that's just the part of the elephant, you know, or I guess in this particular case, standing behind the elephant. All right, so but now you're probably thinking, all right, Big Dave, you're saying that your methodology is without question. No, I question my methodology daily. Okay, I think you have to. You know how hard it was to find clip art with someone with an arrow tattoo <laughs> who also looked pissed off. So am I saying what's out with uh, my methodology is without question? No. Um, it is far from perfect, but it's the best thing I've found after many years of searching. Uh, and this is with personal experience and through the experience of others on both the institutional side and retail. Okay. I've been involved with some things that have gone horribly wrong. It's not something I want to brag about. I have some um, scars from this, but I've learned from the experience. And even with these these things that, even if my analysis was right on the direction of the market, which I was paid to do, if they're doing things where there's too much leverage or there's some sort of uh, small gains with unlimited losses and the trend goes opposite of where they want it to go okay I'm predicting up and they're just hoping that it stays in a range then things can go horribly wrong so I've, I've seen a lot of things go bad personally institutional wise and I see a lot of mistakes of others that's one of the beauties of having my educational business and doing some consulting on the institutional sides, I see a lot of th side. I see a lot of things happen. Okay, so it's far from perfect. Um, sometimes the waiting is the hardest part. And again, I could probably make a lot more money if I'd sell a highly accurate system. You know, could actually trade it because I don't want to blow up. You know, and if you if it did blow up, you just find something new, right? But I've learned that sometimes you just have to wait. And if you go back and read like Livermore, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, that's one of the biggest things he talks about is that you have to sit tight. He's not talking about sitting on your positions, which is also important. He's talking about waiting for the right opportunities. Like Jimmy Rogers said, market wizards, he waits until there's money in the corner and he walks over and pick it up. It's kind of funny. I was talking with, with a friend of mine, trader friend. And I said, yeah, I see what you're doing. You just wait till money in the quantity, walk over and pick it up. And you can tell he actually trades because he said, he says, yeah, I know. But sometimes you're going to pick it up and there's glue stuck to it or and, or, it's, or it's some gum. And while you're picking it, trying to get it off the floor, you know, uh, somebody's taking money out your back pocket. So it's like it's not always that easy. But at least if you position yourself to where you have the best of the best opportunities, which we're going to talk about in just one second you're going to be successful longer term. So you must position yourself for limited losses and unlimited gains, okay? It's not my way or the highway, but I really think it's gonna be hard for someone to build a case against me for saying that we should, we should position ourselves for limited losses and unlimited gains. Now you may argue with me on my approach to doing that, but you can't argue with me that you should go for limited losses and limited gains. Okay, you can't go for small gains and having limited losses. Really? I, I've never seen that work. Now that could work for a while, and you look, you could look pretty smart in the process. But longer term, you're gonna have a hard time, as we just saw. Now here's the thing: make the methodology your methodology, whether it's it's Big Dave's methodology or something you discovered on your own. Now, I really think, and, and I don't mean this from an ego perspective, but I've been around a block a time or two, and I've worked on institutional projects, and I've, I've spent a lot of time with people at retail who have done a lot of different things, private traders, okay? When I say retail, I mean private traders, I guess. Maybe that's a better way of saying it, private traders. And I've seen a lot of people do a lot of things, and in almost all cases, I think, you could take some of the aspects of what I do and make what you do better. Again, it's not my way or highway, and I respect a lot of you who do things differently from me, but I think you could take some of what I do 
to make your stuff better. So you can take a little Dave a la carte. Uh, make it your life's work, okay? If you're fascinated with these highly accurate systems, okay, it's, it's, it's not for me. But if that fascinates you, then make that your life's work and, and be realistic about it. Don't look at it and say, oh, we had a 35% or 40% drawdown uh, when this market had this little crash. But by the end of the year, everything was okay. If you took the next 100 trades, everything's going to be okay. Well, make sure you can live through that and really question how you would react to that. But So if that's what you want to do, make that your life's work, okay? Uh, and know it. You need to know your methodology, but of course, love it, but question it, okay? It's very exciting to come up with a methodology and just look at all the big gains that you would have. But you'd be really surprised that in reality, it might not be as good as you think. It's like someone was showing me the system, and I'm like, well, just give me the, the trade station results or, or spit the results out of some sort of system development program. And it's like, I think they did it by hand. Well, you'd be surprised how many negative signals you're going to miss when you're doing something by hand. I do encourage everyone to 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 – before you try to mechanize something, to do it by hand first, okay? But then also mechanize it if you're developing mechanical systems. I'm a discretionary guy. I just showed you a few minutes ago, hey, this is where the stop is. Mechanically, that's where the stop is. But you have a braid in your head. If it goes up and just kind of nicks the stop and then immediately implodes, then stick with the position. Whereas a mechanical system would have had you out, no questions asked, okay? So it just don't assume that everything is going to work as it does in the future, okay? And don't assume that your max drawdown will be the maximum that you've ever seen. But if you have a viable methodology, and in my case, use a little discretion. I think that a discretion on your setups, discretion on trading more or trading less, I think that longer term you'll do just fine. Market's getting choppy. Market hasn't gone anywhere since last Thanksgiving. Well, I need to get more and more selective, but I like this setup, so I'm going to take it. I like this setup, so I'm going to take it. We caught some really big trends up until now, okay, even though the market's going sideways. But I know on each on, on each next trade, each next trade, is that correct? I need to be very careful going into that trade because the overall market is sideways. So getting back to what the gentleman said about it's hard after seven eight months to feel the winner. You feel the winner will never come. Well, again, it comes with experience and it comes with, with feeling that elephant or, or I should say seeing the elephant. Remember that they're blind men feeling the elephant, but if you're – what you could see, you could see the whole picture. Deliberate practice is something I talk about a lot and it's something that I work hard on every day, okay? And one thing I do is I, I always look at the, the new high list every day. I, and from that new high list, I keep a momentum list. I don't want to digress too far. But I look at the new high list, so I see anything that's moving. And then I ask myself, self, could I have caught this move? Did my methodology or would my methodology have caught this move? And if the answer is yes, then it's like, well, why did I miss it? Okay. And if the answer is no, sometimes markets just go up and it doesn't necessarily fit my methodology as to why they went up, then I don't worry about it. But if you miss the big winner that you should have taken, don't stress. Learn from it, okay? Like my wife tells me, it's like, uh, like I'll tell her, man, I had a stock on my radar and it took off and I didn't take it. And she'll say, philosophically, she goes, well, at least it was on your radar. She told me that years ago. So that makes me feel pretty good that at least it was on my radar. And that's why every day when I publish my trading service, I also publish what I call the Landry List. And those are the exact stocks that I'm going to be trading. Okay. 
sometimes there's something a little bit more speculative that I think that if the people on the service would see on my list, they might actually get really hurt in it uh, because it's so speculative that I might trade personally. But I would say 95 to 99% of the actual stocks I trade are on that, what I call the Landry list. And every now and then I'll miss a big winner off of that list. And like my wife says, well, at least it was on your radar. So, but try to get better. Try not to miss the next one. Go back and do that post-mortem on a missed trade and say, why did I miss this? And then if, after you take a trade, go back and do a post-mortem, good, bad, or indifferent. You may find, this is when your true enlightenment is going to come. When you make money on a trade and you go back and look at it and say, what was I thinking? You will, trust me, you will lose money on a trade and go back and say, what was I thinking? And that's, that's a very, very, very important part of the process. I still do that on occasion. Go back and look at a trade and think, what the hell was I thinking that I lost money on? It wasn't the greatest set of a great a great chat at the time. What was I thinking? What encouraged me to take that trade? Was I trying to dig myself out of a drawdown? Like uh, I always say this for market wizards, intuition versus intuition. Was it intuition or was it really intuition at the time? Like, wow, this is a great position. I need to take it. But the true enlightenment again comes when you take that position and it makes money. And then you go back and do that post-mortem and say, what the hell was I thinking? Because that random outcome of making money makes you think that you did something really well. I'm doing a lot of reading on behavioral finance and trading psychology at all and kind of pulling my own experience into it and thinking about it. And one of the things is that uh, it's been proven that from a psychological standpoint – if something goes right, it's because you're smart. If something goes wrong, it's because of bad luck. We tend to we tend to feel that way. That's how we're wired. So we have to look at something that went right and question whether or not we did the right thing. Yeah, you made money, but it was a stupid trade to begin with. So Maybe it was luck, even though you made money. And it all comes back to proper stock selection. And over the past couple of years, you know, you guys know that I've beat the dead horse on this over and over again. The smarter you are, the harder it is to trade, or the longer it will take you. Because you try to outsmart the market, or you might interject some facts or, or fundamentals even, or something I just said the F word, fundamentals. Or something into the market that makes a lot of sense, that's logical. But markets are often, or quite often, illogical. You're dealing with the behavior of others. But it seems like smart people will send me charts that look like electrocardiograms are bouncing all over the place that they claim to be a trend follower. Well, they're not seeing what's actually there. And so it, it boils down to stock selection. And you've got to ask yourself, is the stock in a persistent trend? And if it is, is that trend accelerating? If it's decelerating, you ought to leave it alone. Is there a new trend emerging? Does the stock trade cleanly? Again, does it trade cleanly? It look like a electrocardiogram. What's the setup? And ask yourself, is the setup viable? Is the TKO deep enough? Is the first thrust big enough to suggest that the trend is turning? It, or the bow tie moving average is confer, con, con, uh, converging. Watch the YouTubes on that if you don't know what that is. But are the bow tie moving averages converging in an emerging trend at a tight fulcrum part point, or, or are they just kind of chopping around? And what's the market doing okay again if the market's going sideways for six months you need to really question whether or not you want to put on a new position what is the sector doing any sexier sisters or brothers within that sector now not only what's the sector doing but what are the stocks doing within the sector 
Sometimes you have a sector that looks like this, and you got one stock in it doing that, and the rest are doing this and this and this and a little bit of everything else, okay? But sometimes you look at a sector, and you've got this as a sector, and then you've got stock after stock after stock within the sector all headed higher. Aha, that's a sector that I want to be trading. So I like my setup. I like the stocks within the sector. And wait a minute, is there any sectors or are there any, any stocks within the sector, any sexier sisters or brothers in the sector, okay? So it all comes down to proper stock selection, okay? So how do you learn how to pick stocks? Well, I put 14 hours into a course on just that, okay? So check it out. Uh, banner ad on my website or go to the store in the project products and uh, $500 off the course until July 27th okay and then if you click on products on my home page or go to store then you can also go down and check out the trading service and if, if you've been coming to these shows for the last several years or 10 years however long I've been doing them I did them in a different venue many years ago, but I would say that 98% or 99% of all my examples that I teach from come straight from my trading service. So you can get started for that for seven bucks if you want to get started. It does roll into a subscription, okay? So consider the longer term subscription if you're getting into it when you're testing things out, okay? Okay, Dave, can you live off your system minus other income, teaching, salt, et cetera? Um, yes, but it becomes a thing like you don't need the money thing. Uh, when things aren't doing well, what happens? Well, I do have additional sources of income. I do have, I do make money through consulting. Okay. Um, if you're a buddy manager, you're not just trading your own money. You're making money off of the, you've got a, you're getting a fee to trade the money and you're getting a, a performance fee and all that. So you're not just, you're not just trading your own account. You're making money through your analysis. So yeah, I make money by consulting. I make money through uh, my retail business and it becomes much easier to trade and do the right thing when you're not having to take the money out of your trading account to pay your bills. Okay. So I encourage people to keep your job and trade on the side. Okay. And you'll do much better than if you, at least initially, quit your job and dive straight in the markets. Because once you are focused, or I should say once you're staring at a screen all day, each little zig and zag becomes much more important than it really is. Okay? Okay, let's take a look at the market real quick. Any questions, anything so far? And, um, and you know, the other thing, too, is when it comes to if you do want to trade a methodology and that's all you want to do, what I would encourage you to do is just be realistic, okay? And this is where it gets tricky. It's kind of like, okay, well, if you could consistently – let's say you could cons consistently make 20% a year without too bad of drawdowns, okay? Well, if you're running a billion dollars – you're going to you're going to have your face on Forbes magazine or whatever magazines are out there, okay? And I can't even do that in math. Let's see. How many zeros after a billion? 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9. Is it 9? My calculator won't go that high. Let's say you're trading whatever the biggest number my calculator will go to. 10 How many zeros after a billion? 1 2 3 4 5 6 Let's see, that's, it's hard to do these things on the fly. I know it sounds crazy. That's a million. Is that a billion? 
10 million. Okay, it looks like I can go to 10 million in my calculator times 0.2 equals. So let's say you're trading, let's just do the math in my head. If you do, if you're trading $100 million and you make 20%, you make $20 million, and then you make 20, you make 2%, uh, I'm sorry, 20% of that, 0.2 times 20 million. You know, you make it a few million a year, and then you're getting a few. Uh, let's say you're getting another two billion a year off of your uh, the maintenance fees and all. So I don't know. You make it five, ten billion a year. It's pretty good, okay? Well, let's say you're trading a fifty thousand dollar account, and you're making twenty percent a year. So you're making uh, ten thousand dollars, and you're gonna have to live off of that, okay? So. <laughs> You know, just do some sort of realistic math. I know everyone's selling the dream. I'm selling reality. So just do some realistic kind of math in your head, and your life becomes a lot different. I don't want to. I don't want to bring bring you down, but um, I was on a panel once, and and uh, you know me, I like to keep it light. <laughs> you know, and one of the guys on the panel was really down in the dumps, and he's he's a successful trader, but one of his friends was also a successful trader. Unfortunately, he put a bullet in his head because he wasn't successful enough. I mean, if this guy would have been running $100 million, he would be sitting on his yacht, but he wasn't making enough money to, um, I don't know if he had a family or not, but I'm, I'm assuming, you know, support his family. So just make sure you're in a position where you can sing like you don't need the money, where you can take the positions and, not worry about them turning into a loss or sit on your hands when things go sideways and not worry about gen generating the so-called income, okay? All right, let's hop out into the charts. Yeah, a lot of questions come in. Good questions, good questions. But my point, I try to temper everybody's expectations at longer term, I think you're gonna be pleasantly surprised. Longer term, you'll catch some really good trends. You do really well. And like I've said before, I've seen people, you know, you get into that, it goes, it comes back to that elephant thing. I've seen people print money just by following me when things are going really well, when I've got that hot hand, that so-called hot hand or whatever, and then they'll quit their job. And I'm like, you don't understand. It's not always this great. I probably spend too much time telling people that it's not always this great when it's great. But if you wrap your head around that and you live through a few cycles, you're going to do just fine. Let's take a look at the overall market. We'll get back to some of your questions in one second. I just want to make sure we get the market covered and uh, so we could jump into some individual stocks too. All right, first of all, let's take a look at the S&P 500. Uh, P's are selling off a little bit today. Um, it's a bit of a bummer because they stalled at the, stop, the top of their range in here. And as you can see, they've gone sideways for months and months and months and months and months. So we got about eight months of sideways movement. You can go all the way back to November if you if you drop it down a little bit in here. And you can see they haven't gone anywhere in a long, long time. So ideally, want to wait for a breakout. This is why I'm super selective in the stocks that I'm picking right now because the overall market is going sideways. Ideally, you want the market going up, the sector going up, and the stocks going up, okay? And sometimes you get two out of three ain't bad. Sometimes you just get one out of three. If you really like the setup, then you go for it. So P's are stuck in a sideways range. By the way, notice that they did hold. This won't always happen, but everything works better with trend. When the market is trending, your simple systems will work best. So let's back the chart way out. And you can see that the 200-day moving average, except for a couple little probes below, we, had, we did have a sell signal right in here, by the way. But for the most part, it's held the 200-day moving average for a long, long time. So, so far... So good. Somebody asked me last week, in fact, if we have, just let me just show you real quick. Somebody asked me last week, how long could this, um, will this leg last? Or how long can this leg last? Well, if you go back into like the 80s and 90s, you could argue that we had a 20-year bull market, okay? And now we're only six years into a bull market. But yeah, the clock's ticking as far as length of a bull market. But we've had 20-year bull markets in the past. So don't think just because it's a little late in this cycle that the trend will necessarily end, the longer-term trend. 
Now getting shorter term, as you can see, P's have pulled back sort of towards the middle of their range, not quite middle, but they've come back in. So that scores as a bit of a bummer. NASDAQ tried to break out in here, and now it's kind of stalling out a little. A little open to gap reversal yesterday. It just needs to kind of get well above this range and not look back for a while, okay? Now, the sector actually becomes, it's kind of like back to that elephant analogy. It's kind of like semis look abysmal in here today, and notwithstanding, a little pop in here today. But so far, they're looking a little questionable. Let's put a bow tie in there. I forget, is there a bow tie? Uh, maybe on a two-day chart. Yeah, look at that, two-day bow tie. Beautiful sell-off in the semiconductor. So they're looking questionable today, notwithstanding, obviously. Take a look at the energies. The energies took out their old lows. And this is why you got to be really careful with classical technical analysis. Oh, it's a quadruple bottom. Let's buy it. No. It could always take that bottom out and keep on going as it has so far. Take a look at the metals and mining. And you can see that they continue to bang out new lows in here. Gold and silver look abysmal. There's gold. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, going down to probe old lows. That's definitely headed lower. Silver still headed lower in here. So let these skies bottom out before we're looking to go after them. On the upside, retail's been doing really well. A little breakout there, doing pretty good. Take a look at drugs. Recently broke out. Looks like they're trying to get back to their old highs. Biotechnology, not too far from their old highs. Looking pretty darn good in here. Chemicals, eh, not so much. Transportation, eh, not so much. Leisure, looking great. You know, it's like you could, you could, whatever, whatever you're looking for in this market, whatever argument you want to make, you could make that argument. I'm going to make the argument to err on the side of the longer term trend. Yes, pay attention to everything that's happening. Pay attention to all these sectors, but continue to err on the side of the longer term trend. We only had that one little chart. We got knocked out of it. Okay. Mechanically, at least. So, so what? Now we just have a couple longs left. We'll hang on those longs and we'll see what happens. We see some new longs. We'll start putting them on with the caveat that eh, there's some areas that are looking a little questionable out there. And as long as the market's going sideways, we better really like a setup before we jump into it. Okay. Okay. What are your thoughts on, on trading stocks that are in a persistent trend one way and the sectors that are persistent trend the other way? i.e. the alligator mouth formation between stock and sectors. Hey, good analogy. Um, it depends. If you really like to set it up, then take it, okay? Um, the Steve Wimler trade, you see a chance, you take it. But you have to make sure you really, really like it, okay? So if it's not the greatest setup at great in setup town or the mother of all setups, then you need to say, okay, wait a minute. The sector's going the opposite way. I better really like this stock, and I really don't like the stock that much, so you don't take it. Now, it's a complicated place, okay? Like, um, I forget the name of the company. I want to say it's CCMP, or I don't know if they're still around or not. But there was a chemical company, and 90% of their business, and I'm not confusing fundamentals. I'm just putting them in a sector. I'm just pigeonholing them, right? But 90% of the business, or whatever the case may be, was this special chemical that they made, which was used to wash off semiconductor boards. So are they a chemical company? Eh, yeah, but they're making a chemical that is used in the semiconductor industry. So even if the chemicals are headed lower, like like they are now, of course, semis are headed lower too, so that's a bad example. But let's say semis were headed higher and chemicals are headed lower, and you like this one stock in the chemical sector, but the reality is it's more of a semiconductor that by all means go after it. It's kind of interesting. The semis are such a are, are becoming such a mixed bag now. They're becoming broader and broader and broader. Uh, I think a lot of your solar stocks are now kind of hidden within semiconductors. When you look at a list of semiconductors, you're going to have solar stocks in there. Yeah, they're making semiconductors, but they're making semiconductors that are really only used in the solar industry. So make sure that that stock is not in the wrong sector. And again, if it's a mother of all setups, go for it. Okay. Carol wants to know about GRBK. GRBK. Easy for me to say, which is a chemical company. All right. So what did we just say about chemicals? Uh, I used to plot them on charts. It just gets too busy. But let me see if I could do it real quick. 
I used to plot the uh, subsector. Let's see if I get it to come up. Comparison visible. Uh, and we're going to do, um, let's see, plot. Comparison. Is there a way to get the subsector in here? It's been so long. Maybe we can do it up here. It's so hard to do this stuff on the fly, like the math calculations and all. <laughs> it's so easy when you're like when there's when you when they, you know here we go plot some of this comparison okay so this is specialty chemicals I have plotted underneath here so what are the specialty chemicals doing you can see they're headed lower okay so Carol likes his stock it's headed higher but the subsector is headed lower so I would pass based on that and the other thing is again this is where you need to start picking apart things. OK, because you're fighting, you're, you've got the alligator syndrome, right? Your alligator mouth, right? Like the uh, someone just said. The other thing, too, is it really didn't get past this prior little peak, and it is kind of wide and loose. So based on all that stuff, I think I would quit. 200 million, 20 percent of a billion. Oh, OK. So, yeah. OK. So if you if you were uh, trading a billion dollars and you made 200 million I'm sorry, you made 20%. You're making $200 million. And of that, you're going to get paid uh, $40 million. So you make $40 million a year plus another, um, what would that be? $2 million? Another couple million here, a million there. It begins to add up. Okay. So if you have a really good year and you're running money, You'll make uh, fifty million dollars a year, okay? If you have a really good year and you're running fifty thousand dollars, then you're going to make ten thousand dollars, okay? So that's that's how you need to look at things. You need to look at your net result, results and not worry about it. Fit, fit. We are long. We are long in the stock. Full disclosure. Um, that's the greatest stock I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, I think it still has potential. It, the pullback could have been a little deeper, as I said, when I recommended the stock, but it looks good. I think it still looks pretty good. I think it's still a viable setup. So, Frenchie, I agree with you on that one. TSS for Jason. TSS. Somebody wants to know about nine. Does that make sense? Yeah, this looks pretty good, Jason. I would put this on my watch list, but it's not quite set up yet. Let it pull back a little bit more. But, yeah, that needs to go on your watch list, okay? HIG, that's going to be an insurance company. Oops. Uh, yeah, same same sort of scenario. Let it pull back a little bit more. But, yeah, it's broken out pretty nicely in here. The HV is a little low, but that's okay. Insurance companies, you're going to have to deal with some, um, some lower stocks. Oh, you're welcome, Carol. UFPI. Let's see if we get the thing to come over here. UFPI. Um, what I don't like is that you've got this one huge up day. Now today's not bad, but you've got this one huge up day, and then you got a few small days, and this day's okay. But you ideally you want to see that stock accelerating higher, and you want to see those bars expanding. You don't want to just go up on one uh, bar. Okay, you don't want that trend to just be one big bar. Oh, you're welcome, Jason. Goog for Joe. Uh, Goog is too late, and it, it it's one case where there really wasn't necessarily any structure to begin with. So what? It took off. So what? Um, there's some arguments, of course, about manipulation here. No. But no, there was nothing that would have put me into this trade. So what did I say earlier about delivered practice? Then move on. So what? Who cares? Okay. Um, I don't see where Google would set up at any particular – it would take a long time for Google to set up again. 
Okay. UFPI, did we cover that one? UFPI. Yeah, we covered that one. Okay. Uh, that's on the Landry list, James. I can't talk about that one. We'll talk about the other one, though, that you're asking. CHMA. Yeah, this is one I'm watching in biotechnology. Uh, it's an IPO. Uh, so far, it's taken off, but obviously you need to wait for a pullback. But yeah, put that on your watch list. That's definitely uh, that's definitely worth watching. GRBK. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we talked about that one. Sorry, I need to delete them. Uh, rare. On a pullback, but yeah, good eye, Carol. Uh, look, this has got your, see, notice how the trend here was working its way higher, and now it's accelerating higher. So keep this on your watch list. Put that, make sure it's on your watch list. And is there a way to see which watch list it's on? CM, used to be CM. Yeah, see this rare, I've got it on a few of my um, watch lists. It's still on my IPO watch list because of the, um, it's technically still an IPO. But yeah, I've got it quite a few. I keep these momentum lists, which I obviously need to clean some out. CMSA. CMCSA, right? CM, CM, CSA. Okay. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, a little trend knockout type of move. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more TKO. This one could be a little choppy. Notice your HV is only 16. That's a little bit low for me to trade. Um, you know, here's it was at $50 a share, and now it's up at $60 a share. And it took a year and a half to, to move 10 points. And never forget something bad could still happen. But if just from a methodology standpoint, yeah, it's broken out, TKO. I would say yes, but I would not personally take it because the volatility is real low. And again, like I said, something bad could still happen. What's the example of a bow tie currently? Joe, what do we, you asked me that last week and I forget which one I showed you. Um, how about VA? There you go, sort of. Yeah, that's a bow tie. Um, it's got a little overhead supply. It's an airline, I'm not that crazy about it, but that's, if you just wanna look at the pattern, that's what the pattern looks like. I like to put in the 50 day moving average and look at the inflection into the 50. That might've been the same one I gave you last week. Sup in. But yeah, show me something that's bottoming out or topping out, and I'll show you if it's got a bow tie in it. Uh, yeah, put this on your, your uh, momentum list, but it's not set up at this juncture. But yeah, absolutely. The only thing that's got me a little concerned would be that it's ran up about 300% in here. So doesn't mean it can't go up another 300%, but it's already had a pretty good run. But yeah, on pullbacks, it's definitely worth uh, keeping an eye on. Okay. Okay, Donna, I appreciate you identifying that. We'll have to look at we'll look at that. Just for that, I'll, I'll, we'll take a look at Ford for you. Don loves Ford. Uh, the arrow is still pointing down there. There's no tradable pattern for me, but uh, yeah, arrow still headed down on that one. Andrea wants to know about uh, Andre wants to know about ANTH. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. It's a little, it's kind of just the opposite as far as volatility. Volatility is really crazy on this, okay? This might be one that I might end up with on, on my own list that wouldn't end up in the Landry list. But longer term, I have a problem with all this implosion from way back here. Um, so I would probably pass based on that. Shorter term, I hear you. Uh, very volatile, very dangerous. It's already ran up about 600%. But yeah, on a pullback, I mean, if you're if you could close your eyes and give it a wide stop and don't trade too many shares based on your stop being wide, then by all means, Ardus, RDUS, RD, RDUS. Um, that looks pretty good, and uh, I'd like to see a tiny bit more pullback. But yeah, if this thing could pull back, let's say to 65, I'd be all over this. This is a good looking stock. Absolutely, good eye. I think that was Carol. NWBO, NWBO. 
Yeah, I mean, this needs to go. This will go if this is not already on my momentum list. It will go in my moment. Let me see where it's. Yeah, it's. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, I got it on a few lists, obviously in here. Um, but yeah, by all means, uh, keep an eye on that one. Put it in your momentum list. Watch it. And on a pullback, you definitely want to uh, trade it. I had it on 3.23 Landry list. Did we trade this one? I don't remember. What was I seeing on 3.23? Oh, I look pretty good. Yeah, it was a little wide and loose, but yeah, it was kind of set up back then. Cool. Uh, AFMD for art. Yeah, I like this one. I do like this one. Uh, yeah, it looks fantastic. Um, you know, you could enter above the high on here. Is that some of my Landry list? Let me see. Ow, it gets confusing after a while. Yeah, it's on today's Landry list. I guess I should have checked first. Uh, but yeah, it looks good. That's a good looking stock. A little bit volatile. HV is 80, kind of crazy. Okay, it's just no, you know, no better the devil you know, but just know that you're getting into a wild and crazy stock. Maybe enter above the high, and stop goes below the low on that one. Fold, fold. Okay, Joe says I appreciate your realism versus instead of the usual go go sale. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, somebody said a while back you could take 10,000 and turn it to 100,000 and then quit your day job. Um, and then somebody in the webinar said, well, can I do it with 5,000? And the guy's like, of course. So I'm just thinking, why not take, let's say 50,000 and put it in to 10, $5,000 accounts and then turn it to a hundred thousand. And then you've got, you know, half a million dollars over whatever the, the period was. It's like, it's not that easy. Okay. But if you take a, a viable, longer term approach and you're consistent in what you do then you're going to be pleasantly surprised okay and yes i will uh i will profit if you hire me to help you do that okay i'm not ashamed to admit that it's like early on i was like oh i feel guilty i'm asking people for money well if you're a doctor do you charge money yes <laughs> you know and this this uh, software I'm speaking of right now, speaking through, costs five hundred dollars a month. So, you know, there are some expenses. All right, uh, yeah. So I'm not completely doing it for for the um, altruistic purposes. Yeah, Don on a pullback. Don's not too good at finding trending stocks, but he's finally found one. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, it's it's ran a long ways though. It's already up five or six hundred percent. Doesn't mean it can't keep going higher, but uh, it is a little long in the tooth on that. Okay. MX. Uh, I still don't like this big gap. We talked about this one last week or week before. Okay. Kind of lightning round. Let me see if I get a few more in. TXMD. Uh, this is interesting. This needs to be on your momentum list. Uh, I'd like to see it clear this prior high in here decisively. But yeah, on pullback, especially if it clears this high. So absolutely, put that on your momentum list. Who said that, Andre? Good job. I'll give you a high five, even though it's not set up. SRPT. Uh, a little wide and loose and all over the place, longer term. Volatility is a little too crazy. Look at that, 118. So, yeah, it's headed higher as of late, but look at the longer term action on this. It trades in big chunks, and, and my methodology is not a be-all, end-all, okay? It's not going to catch every single move. You can't kiss all the women. Sometimes you need to just um, let them go. Artists, R-D-U-S. Um, yeah, we talked about this one. This one looks good. A little bit more pullback would be nice, but, yeah, it looks good. And whatever else I said already on it, I think. Okay. SRPT. Uh, no, see, what I don't like is, yeah, it gapped higher. I like to see him have, when you have a big gap like this, that it's kind of hard to sustain. And then longer term, you can see it's kind of all over the place. looks just like, did we already cover this one? But it's too, it's too, um, too wide and loose. Okay. Um, I think we're, I think we're done. Uh, we're, we reached the, um, threshold of where the recording gets a little iffy. So let's go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, I have a blast doing these shows. I appreciate you guys coming. Great crowd again this week. Great questions again this week. Uh, without you, there is no show. So I really appreciate you guys being here. 
Anything unanswered, daviddavelandrew.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I do answer all emails with the caveat eventually. I've been kind of crazy busy lately. Busy for a summer. I never dreamed I'd be this busy middle of summer, but it's been crazy. So uh, just be patient with me. Uh, and anything that requires a lot of thought and expl explanation, I'll just make it fodder for our next week's show. Anyway, if we don't talk between now and the weekend, uh, everyone have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.